Excellent. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Everybody's coming in quite quickly. Uh, we will kick off fairly soon. I'll only give it a minute or so before we kick off. Lots and lots of people joining. Thank you so much. Welcome everybody. So welcome to our second webinar in the series uh, with Aspen Solutions. So um, I'll, uh, again, lots of people still joining, so thank you. So uh, welcome to the webinar, we'll kick off now. Um, this is about bringing the tough conversations to the table. So this follows on from the last one in our series. And, uh, and certainly this is a apt topic at the moment. I'm sure everybody's been through a situation when they've had to have a tough conversation. So I'm sure you're gonna get some great information from this. So I'm Janet from uh, Team Gauge. I'm the solutions lead there. So today we're gonna to be looking at how we can prepare you for these conversations and also how you carry out those difficult conversations in a group environment and also one-on-one -on -one environment. And you're gonna get some great tips on how you can, what you can take away and use. Just wanna give you a little bit of background to the, the conversations we're gonna to have today. We're gonna to be using the Q&A part of it. So not the chat, we're gonna be using the Q&A. And we really, really encourage you to put some comments in, put some questions in, and we'll, we'll answer those, some of those as we go along and some at the end. So please, please use that Q&A. I know it's an interesting topic, so I'm expecting quite a few questions and comments to come through. We absolutely welcome them, so thank you. Um, at the end of the webinar, you will receive an email which will have a copy of the slides and the recording. It'll have an invitation to our next webinar um, and an invitation to take up Aspen Solutions on a 30-minute uh, consultancy, which I'll explain more about as we go through. So now I'd love to welcome you to Daniel and Leanne from Aspen Solutions. So uh, they run a boutique consultancy called Aspen Solutions that works with clients through change, through leadership, through emotional intelligence, and you'll find out a lot more about them as we go through. So um, I'll hand over right now, they might be able to tell you a little bit more about who they are, but um, there's a couple of things I was gonna mention. Uh, Leanne is very passionate about resilience and purpose-driven leadership and capability. Um, also passionate around her wonderful greyhound called Turbo, um, not to mention milkshakes and New York is a passion as well. So. Um, Daniel, he's very passionate about people development and leadership um, and also Halloween costumes, which I've heard a bit of a story about. So he's going to explain that in a little bit more detail, um, but you can maybe guess who he might have gone as, as, uh, as his Halloween costume. So anyway, I'll hand over to you both. So thank you, Daniel and Leanne. Take it away for us. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Over to you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Janet, as always. Um, yeah, so... The story behind that, as you can see by uh, what you're probably looking at on the screen, um, I do genuinely normally have a beard. Today, if you are looking at the very small box of my face, I've actually just got a moustache. Yes, we've just had Halloween. I hope everyone enjoyed that and, and got into the spirit. Um, I went uh, as Freddie Mercury. So I was actually, I, I went full to the cause and I got rid of the beard and just had the moustache. And if you remember Live Aid Freddy uh, in the white tank top and jeans, that was the Freddy I went for. So, yes, yeah, so I even had the fake teeth as well, which set, set everything off. Um, so, yes, so Halloween uh, I do enjoy. And, uh, yes, this year was Freddie Mercury. So now I've got to try and top that next year. <laughs> and the video of him dancing will be out on YouTube sometime <laughs> in the very near future. I have seen it. <laughs> So Janet, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be back here again. So we hope that we had some people who joined us last time and great if there's anybody new who's joining Absolutely. us. So thank you very much. So we are going to make uh, to get started. So the reality is the tough conversations, right? We've all had to have them. Um, sometimes they're planned and we know as we're walking into one that it's going to be a tough conversation. Sometimes we they sort of come up by surprise and, and we all have to navigate them. Um, and there's some really, there's some things that we really want to take you through today about how you can prepare yourself um, uh, to, to be able to be ready to have those conversations and how to navigate uh, the things as they arrive, both when we're in a group situation as well as um, when we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. What we also hope is that, you know, we, we prepare your people and what we mean by that is maybe not even in, in this instance, but if we can start to, some of the stuff we talk about, if we, we do this enough and we put it up front, we can start to build a culture where having tough conversations is actually something that is more comfortable, if that makes sense. It's, it's, being, it's getting comfortable with that uncomfortable process of the tough conversation. So 
if we can do some of this stuff, and we might need to, we always have to do it for a first time, but if we can do it over and over, we can set it up before we even get there. So Absolutely. So today we're going to take you on a little bit of a journey of how a typical day in the life of a leader may unfold. Um, and we're going to use the, the Team Gauge platform as an example of, of how some of these conversations uh, may come to life. So with that, we're going to kick off. So in this instance, uh, we're planning for a team meeting. Um, we're about to get some real-time feedback from our Team Gauge uh, platform um, before I go into my team meeting to, to, to talk about the results. And I bring up the dashboard and go, whoa, Houston, we have a problem. So if we look at our dashboard here, straight away I can see that trust is in the red um, and has gone down by, by five points. And my leadership has also gone down. So as a leader, I'm about to walk into my people and I'm faced with this. So what might, what might occur for me in this point? So there I am, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at my screen and thinking, now what? The reality is I'm probably likely to be having a bit of an emotional hijack right now. Um, my head could be very busy with lots of different thoughts about what's going on, what haven't I done wrong? well, what, why aren't my team trusting me? Um, my leadership is being in question. Um, and there's a little part in our brain called the amygdala that sits right at the back here uh, in part of our limbic brain, our emotional part of our brain that, uh, that has been there for, you know, millions of years. And uh, it was designed that in the days of cavemen, uh, our amygdala would kick in um, when we felt threatened, say faced with a saber-toothed tiger, and we would immediately go into the place of fight, flight, or freeze. And so that would be how we would protect ourselves. Obviously, in modern day, we don't have to worry about that. But we still have an amygdala hijack, we still perceive threats. Um, and they can still create that same reaction for us. In this case, the threat might be that I'm being judged, I'm being criticized, people don't think I'm capable and competent. And so this can have this emotional reaction for us. So what we're going to look at is what happens when that occurs and what are some things that we can do to help us navigate through that. And so I want to start with this. This is a quote from Viktor Frankl. And so what he says is between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Now, Viktor Frankl, uh, he's a, a well-known psychiatrist. He's authored a number of books, um, some best-selling books that are still on New York Times bestseller list today, but he's also a Holocaust survivor. So it's the space that we're really wanting to talk about today. So between that stimulus and response. So in this case, we've seen our team gauge results or we're about to walk into this meeting, bang, there's our stimulus. And we can walk into this meeting and we can react or we have a, an opportunity to choose in this space how we're going to actually respond to that. So there's some things that we can do. And this is where we, we want to try and navigate our emotions rather than just react to them. And so we can do this by tapping into our emotional intelligence, which is effectively just blending our thinking and our feeling. So what's the thoughts we're having and the feelings we've got in order to be able to make optimal decisions. Looks like somebody's maybe raised their hand. So I don't know if that means somebody has a question. Janet, can you? Um, if you've raised your hand, that would be wonderful if you could pop something in the in the question bar. Let me just have a look in the Q&A. Was... OK, so Magdalena, I think you've raised your hand. So feel free to uh, pop a question in there if you have a question. And we will certainly come back to that. So okay. we're definitely I'll very- I'll you on and Janet, you can let me know if a question pops up. Yes, sounds great. Thank you. So, so it's this blending our thinking and our feeling in order to make optimal decisions. So when, in this situation, when we're going into a team meeting, we really want to be able to leverage our uh, emotional intelligence to enhance our effectiveness and particularly our relationships. So we want to be able to make better decisions, be able to influence outcomes and also continue to foster and, and, and build on our relationships. So this is where we have an opportunity to choose to navigate. Because what we know is that emotions drive people and it's our people that drive performance. So Jana, is there a question there at all? Uh, no, it's all good. We're Perfect. all sorted. Great, Thanks. excellent. I just there want to make questions coming out. through soon. I'm sure I'm just waiting for the right moment. So we'll excellent. see how we Thank you. Okay, so what are some things we can do then? We want to navigate these emotions. We want to be able to respond rather than react. 
So what's some things we can do? We like this simple framework called the RAIN approach. And it starts with this, which is recognize. So the first thing is to simply just identify what's the, what's the emotion that I'm feeling. See if you can actually put a name to it. That's about being curious. Um, often we think, geez, I'm mad. But if we really stop and get to the root cause, am, am I really mad? Or am I frustrated? Am I hurt? <clears throat> am I disappointed? Am I feeling a bit overwhelmed? This is an opportunity to actually get a little bit curious and really try and dig down to understand what is the emotion I'm actually feeling right now. Because if we can name it, what we will actually do is actually take it from this emotional part of our brain back here and we'll actually move it up to the front here, which is the rational part of our brain. And this is where we're then better placed to actually be able to, uh, to, to, to respond and to actually have a conversation rather than coming from an emotional place. We're now a little bit more rational. We also know that when we name our emotions, we can diminish the intensity of it by up to about 50%. So if I am suddenly feeling really angry and I can name that, I can actually help to, to, to diminish the intensity of that. So that's the first thing. We want to recognise actually how we're feeling. Then we actually want to accept it. Um, so this is actually... Um, allow the feeling to be there. We don't actually need to necessarily diminish it. Um, even notice if I'm resisting that. Actually, I don't want to feel that way. I, I want to feel a different way about this. It's actually just accepting that this is how I'm feeling and that's actually okay. And it's giving yourself permission to feel that way. So no matter what the feeling is, just allow yourself to feel it and accept it. Because once we've done that, then we can actually start to investigate it. So this is where we actually, what do we notice about this? Do we notice any patterns that when this happens, I immediately respond or, or feel this way? Um, and notice how intense that is. Um, does it change at all? Um, where in a, my body am I feeling that? Am I, is my face getting flushed? Is my heart beating a little bit faster? Do I feel a knot in my stomach? It's actually just getting curious about what's going on. And then noticing if, when we change our, our position, if we take a drink of water, if we take some breaths, if we go outside or if we talk to somebody, does it actually change that emotion? And does it actually help to, um, I guess, reduce the intensity of that? So this is where we just get curious and investigate it. And then the step, the last step in this is to navigate it. Um, N can also uh, apply for non-judgment. So don't, there's no right or wrong emotions. There's no good or bad. So we don't need to judge how we're feeling about that. It's okay, whatever it is. There are some emotions that are more pleasant or unpleasant than others. And there are some that are more intense or less intense, but it's okay. It doesn't matter whatever it is. We don't need to judge it. And this point, this is where we now want to navigate our way through it. So this is where we can stop. We can breathe. It's not about making the emotion go away because the reality is like waves in the ocean those, they're going to continue to roll through whether we want them to or not. So it's not about making emotions go away. It's actually just being able to learn how to, to surf them and ride them. Now, the way I've described that sounds like it takes a long time, but the reality is we can actually do this in a really, really short period of time. <sighs> What's going on here? Okay, that's all right. All right, how am I feeling? <sighs> yep, might take a drink of water. I'm going to breathe through it and on I go. So this can actually be a really simple process. It's just something to help us in that in that space where we get to choose. Like anything, it's it's, it's one of those things where the more you do it, the, the the better you get it, the quicker you can do it, the more you can regulate through that process. So sorry, Jennifer. That's what I was thinking to say. I think that was a really good point to bring up. I think sometimes it does sound like it's a bit lengthy, but some of the comments around this is that how do we make it more comfortable for ourselves? What can we do to Absolutely. About it, but you were just going to touch on that, so my apologies. No, not at all. You're 100% right. And look, for anyone asking that there, and as Leanne said, that can look like a really arduous, lengthy, tough process to be able to navigate. And you know what? The first few times we do it, maybe it is, and and that's just the way of everything. You know, we're not an expert at something the first time we do it. Like anything, though, the more times we flex that muscle, the larger it grows, and in, in, you know, get, it gets that recognition and, and that knowledge through it. So. As the answer, and then the other point is, it's going to depend on what has caused this reaction in the first place. You know, some things will be minor and we can navigate that pretty easy. Other things are going to take a bit more time and, and are going to really test us to be able to go through the process. So, Janet, was the question, sorry, was how do we, can you just read me the question again, sorry? No, it was, it was a comment around, yes, it can take, seem to take a long time. And it's about how do we make it, how do we make it quicker? What can we do to be more comfortable with this process? 
Okay, so to, to make this a little quicker, the, the, a really quick one for me is name it to tame it. So straight away, actually, what am I feeling right now? Okay, name it, bring it out there, and you'll immediately sort of start to feel yeah. yourself de-escalate. Where am I feeling that physically? And then breathe, walk, whatever it is, do a physical, make some physical change, a, a drink of water, a conversation, whatever yeah. it might be, is a really quick way. Name, pick it up, breathe, move on. And we can actually do that relatively yeah. quickly. Yeah. yeah. I love it that. It's going to be a long process. Yeah. The breathing can't be underestimated. That's a that's a really big one as well. So, so, as soon as it sounds, the old concept, you know, count to 10 and take a few deep breaths. Not quite as cartoony as that, but some actual two or three really deep breaths just to reset. It actually allows you to start to, to change the chemical balance a little bit and actually start to think clear as well. So that's that's definitely how you do it. And then it's just practice, 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 guys. Um, <laughs> So we've done that. So as Leanne said, she's, she's brought up the team gauge dashboard. She's seen trust is down. Her leadership might be in question. She's had this little emotional hijack. She's worked through it and done this and gone, okay, now we're going to go into the meeting. I think I'm ready. I'm set. Let's walk into the meeting. So we go into the meeting with our team and we sit down and you go, look, this might be a really good opportunity. Let's put it out and understand what's going on in the group. So, so with that, we then go and we bring up our team gauge again, and this time we've used it. Um, let's let's drill down as a, as a team, guys. I saw trust is low, and I really want to understand this. So help me understand what's going on, guys. Tell me about this. And we read through some of the comments, and what seems like a really good idea at the start means people, maybe someone gets their feelings hurt a little bit, and someone starts talking about something else, and someone talks over the top of them, and suddenly we've got some differing opinions, and we've got some tempers that are starting to simmer. And we've got a less than productive group team meeting and we've got some flare-ups here in situation. Now I'm suddenly in another scenario going, now I've got to manage a whole group of people who are possibly in an emotional hijack. What am I going to do in this situation? What was supposed to start out as a really good opportunity for us all to be on the same page has suddenly degenerated and we've got behaviours that really aren't being productive and, and at times aren't uh, appropriate either. Um, hopefully this doesn't happen often. I have been in situations where this has happened. Um, it again can be a tough one to try and manage. So let's have a look at how we can do that. First thing is, if we need to, we can stop and, and reset at this point, but it's something that you can use right at the start as well if you need to. And that's let's set our rules of engagement. So the way that we look at this, Leanne and I think there's three categories that we normally talk to people about this for our rules of engagement. And they are the three Ps, cabinet solidarity, and creating psychological safety. So I'm gonna run through these quickly. And as I said, it's something that you can set out as a, as a team foundational idea about all interactions and communications, but it might be depending on your team, something you just wanna reset at the start of each meeting and maybe something you need to touch back on during a meeting as well. So the three Ps. I've always been of the opinion that in a team meeting, that's an opportunity to talk about whatever needs to be spoken about. We can talk about whatever we need to, we put everything on the table and we hash it out. And for me, even as a leader, I wanted my people to tell me what I wasn't doing well, what I was doing well, challenge me on my ideas, as long as we all played by these rules. We were polite in the manner that we did it. We were professional about how we go about it. And it was always coming from a place of being productive to solve the issue. For me, it's not about people taking cheap shots at anyone and diminishing anyone. It's not about being unprofessional or untoward or inappropriate. And it's not just to say, I'm not doing it for the sake of it and try to sabotage and white ant someone. It's got to be productive around that. The next thing for me is this thing called cabinet solidarity. And what I mean by that is I always used to invite robust discussions. Bring it out. Let's hash it out. Let's talk about it how we have to. Again, we lean back on our three Ps to do it, but we can talk about anything we need to. We hash it out in that, in that room and that's our safe space to do it. But when we walk out of that room, we walk out of that room as a united group. We're all on the same page, we're all playing for the same team and we're all headed in the same direction. That singular direction for the whole group. Behind closed doors, we do what we need to. When we walk out, we are a single unit that's united in our ideas. And the last one is creating this psychological safety. We're gonna to touch on this a little bit later and expand a bit. But for this section, what I just really wanted to highlight here is a couple of points. And the first one is we listen as long as we speak and it's judgment free. And what I mean by that is no one, no one takes over the meeting and no one talks longer than they're willing to listen. 
and everyone gets a turn and everyone gets an equal amount of time to voice their opinion because the last thing you want is those if someone feels a little bit threatened they shut down in the meeting and their opinions don't come out we could lose the opportunity to hear something really really valuable because someone doesn't want to talk and someone who's got way too much to say often could probably say half of it and still be overrated so we need to be really fair in the fact that everyone has a chance to speak and when they do we need to know that it's judgment free it firstly it's okay to fail and it's okay to put my opinion out there and it's okay to voice what i'm saying with the knowledge that i'm not going to be ridiculed or downplayed for that there is no judgment around that there's no right or wrong and it's okay to say what you need to even if it's not right we go back to being polite, professional, productive and talking about perhaps why it's not right, whatever it might be. But it's free space to be able to do that and it's safe for us to do it as well. So that's just the rules of engagement. So at this point in the meeting, you might have, hey guys, we're going to shut this down for a moment. Let's just go back to our rules of engagement that we all agree we're going to play by. Next thing we do, if we've been able to do that, we get people back is we want to understand what is, what is causing all this? Where is this coming from? What are these differing opinions? Why are people so animated? And maybe it's because in my opinion, it's simple. It's just trust and it's leadership. Just tell me. Maybe there's more to it I don't really understand. And so the next part we want to do is we want to do this thing called seek to understand. And what this means is I'm not going to come in here with a preconceived idea of what the answer is and tell you all about it. Because as you can see in this picture, I might have an idea of what this landscape looks like. But what I might not be doing is I might not be looking at it through the same lens that you do. And I miss the intensity of the colors and the, and the descriptors around that. So what I really want to do is I want to start to break that down and some really good um, statements you can use if you like around this can simply be, hey, look, my assumption has been X, Y, and Z. What might I be missing? What do I need to further understand from your perspective? What haven't we explored yet that's relevant to X, Y, and Z? What hasn't been said that needs to be put out on the in the table for us or this issue to be moved forward? And tell me more about how you see this. What we're really trying to do here is we're trying to investigate anything that I might not understand. What are all the circumstances that I just don't know? I don't know what I don't know. If I'm shut down and closed off to that, I might be missing some really valuable information or insights that other people can share. It's at this point here that you need to understand if we are sitting in a situation where it's more important to get to win the argument, then we're actually not looking at resolving the issue at all. So these are great questions that you can ask that give permission, people permission to speak. So even if there's somebody who's probably less likely to want to speak up in that environment, you can actually direct one of these questions directly to them. Tell me more about how you see this particular situation. We haven't heard from you yet, please share. So it's actually inviting people and giving them permission and the freedom to actually speak up. Now, Jana, I'm aware that we've had something pop up yes. in the chat. So do you wanna share? Yes, so I think go back to the last slide as well. There was, I'm just thinking about that is when, when do you set these rules of engagement? Because I think they're really useful and yeah. I think obviously they're gonna be really helpful in the meeting, but when do you set them? Okay, for me personally, this is one of the first things I would always have over the years, I developed almost my introductory speech to any new team that I walked into. And I kind of talked about who I was and what my expectation of myself was, and that it was my expectation of myself was equal to the expectation I had of everyone else. And if we played on that level, we'd all be the same. That's great. And that's where I put it up front. So for any new team, I'd say, Hey guys, when we're in this team meeting, this is what this space is. And I'd run through the three P's and cabinet solidarity. And it's a safe place. So, I'd set that up front. Now, you might have an existing team and that's okay. There's nothing saying that you can't turn around in your next team meeting and go, hey, look, guys, I just want to make sure that we get the most out of our meetings. And to do that, there's some rules we're going to play by. At that point, if you do that, it's a really good opportunity to set that up as a foundational piece because then if you happen to go partway through that meeting or maybe it's two meetings down the track and we haven't mentioned it and suddenly we get one of those unruly meetings, we can go, hey guys, before we go any further, we're just going to shut this down for a moment. Just want to reha re rehash the rules of engagement that we all said we were going to play by. So it's a, it's a tough one as well for anyone to argue against because you're really just talking about treating anyone else how you'd want to be treated. So if anyone's got an issue with that, it's a good opportunity to try and hash that out because it's hard for anyone to argue they don't want to be treated the same as anyone else. So yeah. that, that's when I'd be doing it. 
So I think to ask the, the answer the question, it can really be done at any time. Yes. Um, if you're setting up a new team, that's an ideal way to kick that off. Um, if you're coming into a meeting and you know perhaps in advance that it might be one that's going to be a little bit difficult. Hey guys, today we're going to talk about some things that might be a little bit challenging. So before we get started, it might be at that point. And even if you haven't done that and then something comes out from nowhere and it blindsides you a little bit, it's an opportunity to go, hey guys, I don't feel we're being as productive as we can right now. Let us all reset. And why don't we try this again with some ground rules? So the reality is I don't think there's any right or wrong there's time. Uh, you can bring it in at any time. Um, and as often as you need to. If that's yeah, the and case revisit too. it whenever you have yeah. to. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's really about the concept that, you know, if, you, if we're all consumed with winning our own argument, then we can't be focused on resolving that issue. You know, if, if we either work together to resolve the issue or we simply work against each other just to prove our point. If that's the case, it's a, it's less than productive and worthwhile. So, the so last slide is well, sorry. those questions as well about the really really useful. Um, yeah. Certainly, sometimes it makes the meeting seem a bit longer, but it's really useful to make sure we've got everybody involved. So, a couple of comments that came through with that, I think, and I think Great. you know the involvement, making sure um, the people who wouldn't normally say something have that opportunity. So that's yeah. And. The time is certainly an interesting one. Hey, we've only got a certain amount of time. And so if we're suddenly now going to ask everyone to speak for an equal amount, that might be a, you know, might be a challenge from keeping to time. But I would argue that the time invested in doing that there yeah. and being able to resolve the issues is going to save you a whole lot of time and pain and energy down the track if things <laughs> aren't resolved or if people haven't spoken up and are later walking out and having water cooler conversations. Um, so it might be time well spent. Because you may actually be n negating some potential tough conversations you might have to have if you don't spend this time in the first place. So um, we did on the last slide as well, just in the interest of time, but we talked about the last point with that psychological safety piece. And it's really about building that trust within the team. So this next slide, Leanne's going to talk through around how important it is and, and, and a fundamental way that you can do that within your team as well. So this is actually uh, what we call the, the Lencioni Trust Pyramid. And it's uh, by Patrick Lencioni who wrote the book, Five, uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And he actually talks about the, the pyramid, the building blocks required to actually have a high performing functional team. And it starts with this, it actually starts with trust. And without trust, it's really, really hard to build on, on the other elements. And vulnerability is what builds trust. So as a leader, it's actually being able to go into a conversation and ask those questions and say, tell me what's going on from your perspective. I want to know what how this occurs for you. And being willing to ask the tough questions, listen to the answers and take on feedback. Um, sometimes it might be about your leadership. It might be about communication. You need to be prepared and willing to, to show up and, and listen because these are the things that will actually build trust with your people and that's without that it's very very difficult um, to implement the other factors so when we have trust we can then move up to the next element of the period pyramid which is that psychological safety which gives us the opportunity to have a healthy approach to conflict so we don't want to take conflict off the table but we actually want to be have a healthy approach to that so it's actually about recognizing that we're not always going to agree and that's okay but how do we have a conversation where everybody gets a say and we can consider that. So it's that everybody gets a turn to speak and I know that I can put my hand up and share my opinion and I'm not going to be shot down in flames for that. And that's what's that healthy approach to conflict. Which takes us to the next element of the pyramid, which is actually getting demonstrated commitment. Now that's not necessarily consensus. So it doesn't mean we need every, we can't leave the room until everybody agrees. But it is about actually aligning to the bigger purpose, uh, the objective of this project, the purpose of this team and organisation, the goal we're trying to achieve. Even if we don't necessarily all say, yes, this is the, this is, I agree, this is the best way to go forward, as long as we're all committed and aligned to the, to the overall goal and outcome, that's what we're looking for, that commitment, as opposed to necessarily that consensus. And when we have that, what we also get is a sense of accountability. So people then take ownership of, of their part in this. And this is where, again, we get clear about, the result, clear about the rules and what's expected of everyone. And then we're more likely to get accountability from people. And if we can do all of these things successfully, we get to the top of the pyramid, which is actually the attention to results. And the reality is if, we, if we've got all of these other foundations in place, the results will speak for themselves. It's really about creating that trust and that environment 
and being aligned to that that purpose that allows us uh, to actually be able to deliver the results. As Lynn said, if we get the base part of this right, we do the hard work up front and the rest of the steps become a lot easier. Quite often we we look at things from a, a KPI perspective, whatever it might be, and we, we focus on the results and we have to get the results and we kind of lose track that if we, we don't set this up properly to be able to let that happen more by itself. The other thing in this, as you might notice, when we have a look at the, the rules of engagement that we talked about earlier, we're talking about that healthy approach to conflict, which is that creating psychological safety. The demonstrated commitment is that cabinet solidarity, that single direction we all want and, the, and accountability. Be clear about the rules. We all know what they are and we all agree to them. We're going to all apply to those three P's and our rules of engagement are in place. So as I said before, they're the, they're the sort of concepts that Leanne and I talk about with the rules of engagement and they fit perfectly within this trust pyramid as well. So hopefully we've, we've done that. And what we've been able to do in that sense is we've got our meeting back on track and we've got out of that and hopefully we've enjoyed that and we've worked through and we've gone, okay, we, we, we navigated that one as well and we got everyone back on, on, on track. And we're out of that, we've gone, okay, what are some actions that we're going to take out of this? And we've documented some actions. And you can see here, one of them is to actually catch up with everyone. And maybe we need to just check in about that. What we also probably know is that that meeting got a little bit off track. And what, we, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to have a chat to a couple of people maybe about their behaviours and their attitudes and, and some of their actions that weren't necessarily appropriate in that. And maybe they didn't align to the rules that we set up. The other thing is some of the actions in that single direction, we know our team well and we got some really good vacant nods coming from a lot of people, but how much buy-in was behind that nod? And we kind of know that that person's nodding away in the back of their head, they're going, yeah, not interested, not playing. So again, we might need to have some tough conversations about making sure they're on board with that. So again, how do I know that I'm ready to be able to have that conversation? How am I going to be effective in that process? And how do I set that up to actually be able to have that tough conversation? First one is this. We oh, talked about this as a, as a something there as well. There was a, a comment yeah. from, um, that came through. Thanks, Joe. Um, about that, the commitment and the psychological safety. When yeah. you know that someone's in the room and they perhaps have made it obvious they don't necessarily agree, yep. and you've got the commitment, everyone's moving forward. Yep. How how do you handle that when you you know that someone's not necessarily on board or maybe a couple of people, um, and you're not sure whether or not they're in that commitment? How do we make that work? Yeah, look, that, that's a really good point. And there, there's probably a couple of approaches you can take. One might be, act, depending on, uh, I guess, on the trust you have within the team, the time that you have available and how you think this might show up for the team, you might actually call that out. Like, hey, I'm seeing, Sam, that you you really don't look like you're on board with this. Go back to some of those seek to understand. Tell me, yeah. what, tell me what's exactly. showing up for you. What are you thinking about this? I'm really not, I'm not getting a sense here. That you're actually on board with this and if, if you feel it's it's appropriate in the best interest of the team call it out and use some of those um those questions that we that we put there forward yeah. and give them an opportunity to speak alternatively you might not want to make it uncomfortable for that person um you know you and it might be a better approach to let the meeting continue to finish on and then have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with this person. And, yeah. and what we're about to get into now is a little bit about uh, ways that we can actually structure a conversation one-on-one -on -one with somebody. So there's a couple of options and I guess only you can read the room and, and know your people well enough to know which way to take that. But you can either call it out and address it there. But if not, I would absolutely encourage, don't just sweep it under the no. carpet but actually pull that person aside later yeah. and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And we're going to now cover what that might look like. Absolutely. Just, just to further to that, because Leanne's exactly right. Really the only way to effectively do that is to engage in it. It's it, If you let it go and you just look past it, it doesn't get resolved and it just sits there and you know what's really going to happen. What it's all about is if we go back to the, that Lencioni uh, trust pyramid, it's about creating that vulnerability and that safe place and psychological safety and having that ability to go, I don't know if it's just me, I'm not finding that everyone's on board and, and I don't want to call anyone out. If anyone's got anything they're not really calling out. And as I said, you you know your team and you can read the room and hopefully if you do enough of this enough times, you create a space to go, hey, Janet, look, I, I don't know if it's just me. I'm, I'm getting the sense that there's something you're not really understanding or you're not buying into. Help me understand. Are you... What are you thinking about this? What are you seeing in this? What is it you don't you don't see or agree with? Let's talk about this. So it's about being having the vulnerable space to be able to engage in that and then create the space for them to be able to, again, I'm judgment-free. 
I can say what I need to. I don't agree with this. I don't like this. It's not how I would do it without that idea of I don't want to say anything because I'm going to get persecuted by everyone else or I'm going to, I'm going to get made to ridicule me, made to be foolish. So it's really about creating that culture of having the tough conversations, which, you know, at the start we said, yes, this is about how to address that individual conversation. How do we set up a, a, an environment and a culture where tough conversations are a part of the day that's okay, not something to be feared and to run away from as well. So it's not no no silver bullet five minute quick fix. It, it's something that needs time to to, to work out. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point, and it relates to the the conflict side of it as well. As that, as a, as a leader, we shouldn't shy away from it. No. We, we should be able to have the courage to say, "Look, there's something I'm missing. You know, please can you you help yeah. me understand this?" Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really great point. A lot of the time, we we tend to move away from it, or we tend to don't want we don't want the conflict ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah that, that's great. Thank you. No, um, nobody nobody enjoys that, but it no. is about having the courage to have those sometimes <clears throat> uncomfortable conversations yeah. because the more we have them, the less we probably have to. Correct. Yeah. The, so there's the, another question coming through about if the trust indicator has declined, how likely is it that the team will generally open up in this team meeting forum? Great question. Thanks, Alicia. It, it is a great question. Um, and look, the reality is, Again, only you will know your own team in that regard. Um, and it might be that the team meeting is not the best place to bring that up. Um, that it might be that it, it is one-on-one -on -one conversations. One thing to recognize is that what the example we've used here is using the Team Gauge platform, which is an anonymous tool for people to be able to yeah. give feedback. So it's certainly not about going in and pointing fingers and who made this comment and who said that. That's the worst way <laughs> to, to address that. Um, but I think it's something to just get curious about. Hey guys, look, I, here's our results and, and trust is diminished and I'm really curious to know what that's about and so, I think if we come from a place of being curious um, as opposed to who did this who said that and being accusatory and defensive um, be open to, to open up the space uh, to allow people to, to speak the reality is you're not always going to so you, they're, they're um, not always going to be willing to do that you, you don't believe in the lock-in method we're here and no one leaves until we get to the bottom of this it's, <laughs> I, am, I am not subscribing okay, to the lock-in okay, method okay no. fair <laughs> just just checking for me. no there is no but slide about the lock-in no method. Look, and it's, it's, that, that is a great question you know if if we see that that's that's dropped that how willing are people going to be able to do that and you know what that might be a great opportunity here, guys this is where we're at we actually don't have anything to lose here so as your leader, I'm going to be vulnerable and say, I take this on board. I am responsible for this, for whatever's happened, that this culture that's been created of this is my responsibility. Help me understand what I can do better to make this better for you. And that's that vulnerability piece as your leader. So start at the bottom. Vulnerability builds trust. I'm putting my hand up as a leader to go, I'm responsible. I can't fix this without your help. You, didn't, you obviously don't like where we are in this 45 being our trust. How will we work together to make this better? Start at the bottom, build that base up so we can work up that, that pyramid again. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thanks, Daniel. I love that answer. And I think it is sometimes if we can't get the, the conversation open, put it back on ourselves, you know, Absolutely. What, what can I do? So yeah, I hope that hope that's answered your question, Alicia. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. There's another one that's come through as well. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mars. Um, What's a good phrase to close out a uh, close an out of hand heated conversation to take it to another time and place? <laughs> I told um, you I was right, and that's enough of that. No, no, no. no don't listen to him. Um, there is actually we're going to come to this in a little while, but there's a technique called the circle back. Yeah. So I will jump ahead a little bit to that. We will touch on we, it again. Yeah, I was to say, why don't we? We'll hold on to that great question. Um, we won't forget that you asked it because we will we will circle back to that in a little bit. I see what you did there. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, look, great questions. All of these so far have been great questions. Thank you for everyone who's submitting them. We really appreciate them because they give us an opportunity to talk off the slides and a little bit more candidly. So we appreciate that. This is where we talk about. So where we're at here is, is giving that feedback. We now know that we've got some tough conversations to have off the back of that meeting as we talked about. And some of those questions talk about, hey, that wasn't a great meeting about trust. We, but we need to have a chat about some people's behaviours and, and whatever it might be. To do that, though, what we don't want is we don't want another throwaway meeting that's going to be half-hearted and we're not courageous enough to have and we're not going to be effective in doing it. So the only way to do that is to prepare ourselves. It's that whole 
and I don't like, I don't really like the analogy, but it's, you know, if we're on a plane and the, and the gas mask dropped down, sorry, the, the oxygen, air, oxygen, oxygen mask, mask. Yeah, I'll tell you that. The oxygen mask dropped down, you know, it's a case of put your own on first before you try and assist someone else. And this is no different. How do I set myself up in a place where I'm ready to do this effectively? Because I want to do that to respect and value the person I'm actually going to have this conversation with. So this is something that we can do around that. It's a little checklist for ourselves before we even step into the process. And the first part is I'm ready to give feedback when I'm ready to listen, ask questions and accept that I may not fully understand the issue. So I, I, I don't, I'm ready to recognize that I'll put my hand up and be vulnerable. I don't ask, I might not know. If I can say that the next one is I recognize your strengths and how you can use them to address your challenges. So it's not about telling someone they're wrong and they've got no choice and you have to do it and they, they don't do it the right way. How do I recognize their, their strengths? What can they do to help them address that? If I can talk about that, I can now go, I can hold you accountable without shaming or blaming and I'm willing to own my part. Again, that's the case of I'm not shaming you for that and, and you, it's not a blame situation. However, these were the actions that you did and we need to talk about those actions. Let's remove the emotion and the blame out of it, but we need to discuss why they weren't okay. And I'm willing to say, hey, maybe I let that go on too far. Maybe I allowed that to happen. Maybe I haven't set a foundation as your leader. That's my part in this. And then lastly, I can talk about how resolving these challenges will lead to your growth and opportunity. You know, often people think, oh, I've been, I've been marked as the black sheep of the team and I've got no opportunity here. Can I look at a situation and go, let's talk about how we resolve this for you, but then also how we can use that as growth and development for you and what opportunities that might then provide you as well. So this is just a little checklist. If I can check these things off, then maybe I'm in a situation where I'm ready to actually have that tough conversation. So I've prepared myself. And if I can't tick them all, then now's probably not the time to have the conversation. And I may need to go away for a couple of hours or, or overnight um, before I actually sit down and, and, and can prepare myself to, to have a conversation because it's probably not going to, nobody's going to win in a conversation where I'm not coming into it with the ability to be able to, um, to really tick off these questions. Yeah. Now to do that, to do that. So um, if any of you know anything about me, you know that I'm a big fan of Brene Brown. I've done a lot of her work. She uses this, uh, this approach, this concept called living big. And this is what it is. So the first one is boundaries. This is actually about being clear about what is expected. So when we're having a conversation, it's actually being able to tell somebody what is and is not okay, about being really clear about the boundaries. So something along the lines of, hey, Sam, it's okay that you didn't agree with the decisions we made in the meeting. It's okay that you weren't on board with that and you didn't think that we were taking the right approach. That's okay. What's not okay is for you to actually slam your fist down on the table, to throw your chair back, um, to actually start name calling and, um, and, and be rude and, and disruptive. That's actually not okay. So boundaries is just really being very, very clear about what's okay, what's not okay, and what is the expected level of behavior or performance. Integrity. This is around for me as a leader, choose what is right over what is fun, fast and easy, which means if Sam has behaved that way in the meeting, I don't turn a blind eye to that. I don't just go, oh, he was having a bad day or she wasn't, you know, in a good space today or, and, and you know, I'm just going to let that slide. No, it's actually going, you know what, that behaviour is actually not okay. And so now I'm choosing to actually have a conversation and call that out. So it's actually holding ourselves to account of not turning a blind eye uh, or being willing to walk past something um, and let it go. If it's really not okay, then we need to have a conversation. But it's also about having generosity. So it's also assuming the most generous thoughts about the intentions, the words and the behaviours of others. So this actually comes from a place of recognising or believing that everyone's doing the best they can with what they have right now. So even if somebody's behavior in the meeting wasn't okay, we're gonna assume that in that moment, they were actually doing the best they could right now, but my integrity tells me that that wasn't okay and their behavior has gone outside the boundaries of what's acceptable in my team. So, but now I can come from this place of it still at least perhaps recognizing they were doing the best they could, but we're now gonna have a conversation and be really clear 
about what what is and isn't okay and what I need from this person going forward. So that's a concept that if you can come into a meeting or into a conversation with these uh, concepts in mind, um, it allows you to have a much uh, clearer, better conversation that's going to get the outcomes you're looking for. The other thing as well is if we look at back at the, you were talking about the rules of engagement and we talked about seeking to understand, for example, that really just rolls up into this. So we did that in a team meeting, but we really need to hold ourselves accountable and the person we're having this meeting with accountable to do those same things in this framework, you know, the boundaries, the integrity and the generosity piece as well. Yeah, there's a comment that came through about that generosity piece. Uh, really, really useful, I think. Um, to understand that people are trying to do the right thing and to, to recognize that they may not have the same values that they that you do Correct. or they may not be understanding how their values fit with the direction so i think the generosity piece and that was a comment that came through thanks jamie um that was a comment that came through about you know how, how do we ensure that and i think that goes back to the piece you mentioned at the beginning how do i prepare myself to believe that they're coming from a good place and then how do we handle that so, and yeah. generosity is, I'll be honest, is often the hardest one for people. There's no way they were doing the best they can. They were just trying to undermine me in the meeting. And, and so that's a tough one. People will be challenged by that. But if we can try and put aside some of that and come from the place of being generous to think that people are doing the best they could right at that moment, let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, will, it will change the nature of your conversation if you can come from a place of, of being generous. I kind of, you're right, it can be really difficult to, to believe that generosity piece at times. Um, uh, we've all managed people, they're, they're amazing beasts and animals and do some amazing things at amazing times. But for me, it's a really good opportunity to go, hey, I'm being really generous to believe you were doing the best you can and I don't get it. And maybe it is the values or I don't understand your perspective. So this is where we go back to seek to understand. Help me understand in this moment what you thought, felt, were going through. I don't know everything that happens in your world. And we, we don't know everything that happens in people's worlds outside of this initial thing. We don't know what's causing the think, feel and act like this. That's our opportunity to seek to understand because I'm being generous at the moment. I'm giving you the opportunity to, to help me understand this. From there, we can then make a determination if they are genuinely doing the right thing or they're being a bit of a, a pain. So with that said, this next piece is, is a really good uh, a tool for you as well. Again, some more statements around what we can often do is we can go into a meeting. If we call someone to a meeting after the meeting we've had that went a bit awry, people can go, oh, here we go. I'm going to tell off. I'm in trouble, this and that. What we need to do is get really clear at times about what we do want people to take out of the conversation. So what we want to try and do is remove any stigma or idea of, of preconceptions they might have. That helps us get really clear about the message we're delivering and it doesn't allow them to get hijacked or get sidetracked in thinking something else and missing the point. It's a really good tool within this conversation to keep bringing back to as well. So let's have a look at what we mean here. So the first part of this is what I don't want you to think is what I need you to know is because what we want to do is we want to take the preconceptions off the table and we want to almost preempt what we think those initial reactions might be. Let's get them out of the way and let's actually talk about what's going on. So what I don't want you to think is your job's in jeopardy. This means you're in trouble. We don't value and appreciate you. That's not what this is about. So we want to take that out, out of the equation. What I need you to know is there are gaps in your performance that we need to work on. There will be upcoming changes to your role or your behavior does not meet or match our agreed values. So these are just some really good ideas. This contrasting statement's a really good concept that, as I said, sets up the conversation we're going to have preempts anything that they might get a little bit hijacked by or, or want to fixate on, removes that and really gets us clear about the message we're trying to deliver. So that's a really good opportunity within that conversation as well. This is such a simple framework. And yeah. when you can frame conversations like this, you will find it will actually change conversations with your kids, your partner, <laughs> whoever it might be. What I don't want you to think is this, but what, what I want to talk to you about is this. Yeah. Um, this one's been a game changer for me in my life across a number of different areas. Yeah. So I, I really, I would really encourage you to, to Absolutely. have a play around with this one and see how it works. Definitely. Now, lastly, and we are, we're going to do exactly what this slide talks about to the question we had earlier, the circle back. The circle back. So this is another tool that you can use. And this can come into play in a number of different ways and, and times. And it is <clears> actually the circle back. 
So this is actually an opportunity to revisit a conversation or an interaction after we've had time to fully process. And so we may need to circle back if we require clarification or if new information arises. And we can actually, uh, it's also an effective way to make amends for something we did or to simply check in on the relationship. So to the question that came up earlier, this is an opportunity to, we might be in the meeting um, and, you know, we might need to sort of take a little bit of a time out, you know, hey guys, you know what, we're going to call it quits here, or we might be having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and go, you know what, I don't feel that we're actually getting to the outcome right now. I think it's time we actually just take a little break and a little time out. Um, let's each go away, have some time, and we're going to circle back. We'll meet again in 20 minutes, half an hour, later today, tomorrow whatever it might be. So it's okay to actually kind of recognize and stop and go, I actually don't think where this is productive right now. And this is not, neither of us are getting the best outcome. So let's take a break and we'll circle back. So you can do that mid conversation or mid meeting, you can stop, take that break. And then it's up to one of you to, or, you know, to, to go back and actually reconnect. You can, you know, the meeting might have gone okay, the one-on-one -on -one conversation might have gone okay, but you might have walked away and later thought, I really actually didn't like how that, I didn't like how I showed up. I didn't perhaps, I don't feel like perhaps handle that as well as I could. Um, I might now like to just go back and circle in and check, how's this person going? Is there anything else we need to discuss? Is our relationship still intact? Are we okay to move forward? So the circle back is really, easy. It might also be that somebody's brought up an issue in the meeting and you go, wow, that is, that is information I did not know about. Um, you know, perhaps something in the team meeting about why trust is low is they've just heard that this department's going to have 10 redundancies. This is perhaps information I don't know about. So I might not be able to continue with that. I'm going to have to take that away and look into it. Now I can circle back and say, I've had an opportunity to look into that and here's some information mm -hmm. for you. So the circle back is really effective technique. And one, if you feel yourself getting a little bit triggered or hijacked and you think that perhaps, wow, I'm not handling myself so well here. You know what? We might just take a break here and then you've got the opportunity to come back. So don't underestimate how useful this can be um, and how helpful yeah. it can be. And there's absolutely no shame in, in no. Kind, kind of, calling you know pulling stumps on something because it's not working right now let's take away we'll all fully process we'll consider and we'll come back and then you can start the conversation with a contrasting statement what i don't want you to think is i didn't want to continue this conversation with you what i need you to know was that at that point in time i didn't feel that we were getting productive and it was time for us to take a break or help me to understand what was going on yeah. for you so there's a lot of ways we can then come back there's a couple of key points of that and as leanne said you know it's got to be genuine and it's, it, you've got to be sincere in the concept of why you're doing it. And it's got to be deliberate in the sense that we set a time frame. You know, look, let's take 20 minutes. We both need just to go away. Give me 20 minutes to go and get some more information. Let me just um, see what I can find out, whatever it might be. Hey, 20 minutes, let's come back. Hey, you know what? Let's go away. Let's let's reconvene in a couple of hours. Let's do this then. Or you know what? Hey, let's, let's meet up first thing tomorrow morning. I, I think I've got a few questions. I just want to go and form them. Let's have a chat about that tomorrow you know, set a definitive time frame of it. Don't leave it, leave it loose ended and make sure it's sincere in the manner of which you do it. Guys, that is a pretty full on day in the life of a leader. I hope you probably <laughs> understand. If you've had to navigate all of that in one single day, well done, hats off to you. We have absolute admiration. The problem with that is we've also both been leaders as has Janet and I can absolutely guarantee we can all sit here and nod and go, yes, I've had to navigate all of that in one day and probably three or four times a week. So for all those leaders out there, we do feel your pain. We've been through, we understand it. We really hope you get some value and some understanding out of some of those tools and techniques we've offered you there. Um, we're going to hand back to Janet in a moment, just, just to do the obligatory stuff for team gauge, of course. But if there's any questions, anything else you want to know about, please hit us up. We'd love to have a chat with you. So absolutely, Janet, back to you. Yeah, I, I love that circle back one. And I think it works really well personally and professionally. Um, yeah. I know I've used it with my son when you need time out because one <laughs> of the is having those high emotions. Yep. Um, but I also think you mentioned a really valid point there about the time frame. I think yep. it's really important to, to put a time frame on it, whether it be 15 minutes or tomorrow morning or... Absolutely week or whatever it's going to be and then live up to that time frame so i think that's really important for the circle back and it just makes it a little bit more um understood and again building trust 
So yeah. The circle back is, is just a nice one, even after, a, even if we've just had a one-on-one -on -one and I've had to give somebody some feedback, it doesn't even need to be a, a huge, big conversation we've had. Perhaps I've just had a, you know, a monthly catch up with somebody and there's some areas in their performance. They might've been feeling a little bit, you know, not so good about themselves. You can even just circle back later in the day and just go, hey, just checking in after our one-on-one -on -one earlier, just checking you're doing okay. It can be as simple as that, but it is actually really effective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really good. I like that one. Uh, well, thank you so much to both of you. Um, I really hope everyone's got some tips and some some really useful questions or statements. I mean, there's some great information in there. So I hope that's worked for you. Please still put some questions through if you uh, if you Surely. want. To. Um, I want to now move you to the next one in the series. So um, we do have a, another one in the series with Aspen and Team Gauge. So uh, we're looking at building optimism for 2000, 2021. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, 2020 has been an interesting year for a lot of people. Um, <laughs> so let's let's have a great start to uh, to 2021. Come and join us on the 10th of December, yeah. um, same time, and we'll look at building optimism for 2021. So same date calendar. An invitation will follow with the um, the email with the slides and the recording. Um, and uh, also we wanted to mention the um, starting strong with Team Gauge. So again, we're offering three months free so that you can really kickstart your um, 2021. So anyone that signs up with Team Gauge um, just before Christmas um, will get th three months for free. I should have practiced saying that, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, come and join us. And remember that Aspen have also got their um, 30 to 40 minute co free consult. So connect with connect with Aspen, with Liao, Daniel on that and uh, lock in your, your opportunities. Um, and then lastly, all I was- You're about to have and you want a little bit of coaching before you go in, pick up the phone. We'll have a chat with you and help you out before you go into your meeting. <laughs> That's actually a really good idea. And I highly yeah. recommend that you guys use that. So, you know, Leanne and Daniel are offering that time. If you've got a difficult conversation or you're going to bring some conversations to the table in a team meeting, um, really honestly take them up on that offer. It's well worth it. Yeah. Love so to. any other questions coming through? There's there's nothing yet on the, on the dashboard here. So I thank you for all the positive comments that are coming through. Uh, so please connect with either of us. Um, you can catch us on LinkedIn or of course, um, you can catch us by sending us an email through. Um, so thank you very much, Leanne and Daniel. Um, thank you to everybody that joined us. Um, thank you for all the comments. All the comments are still coming through. People got a lot out of it. Um, interested about the, the use of Team Gauge um, and uh, conjunction with Aspen, which is fantastic. Um, so yes, thank you so much for all the positive comments that are coming through. I can't read them quick enough. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, hopefully you'll be joining us on the next one. You will get your invitation out very soon. So um, keep popping the questions or the comments through. We really appreciate it. Um, and then we, we know how we're helping you. So thank you again, everybody. And we will speak to you very, very soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today.